This is Ras country. Steep two rocky ledges with crusty, barnacle-coated gullies cutting hard into the land. Under these gentle swells, there's a forest of storm-hardened marine growth that can eat like tackle for breakfast and gives even the toughest fishing gear a rough time. If you're a green crab, low water provides a little respite from the searching eyes of the big ballon in the sky. The time to make yourself scarce is when the tide turns. Then it's a different story. This kind of ground stretches from Shetland to the Scillies, Sweden to the Canaries, and often, haunting a world of undertow and kelp, you'll find big, bold ballons. The hunt for big balance could have taken place at a number of UK locations, the west coast of Ireland, the Welsh coast, the West Country. We chose Alderney for a number of reasons. First, it represented a compact, rugged coastline, just one and a half miles by three, with loads of typical RAS ground. Second, some of the best RAS recorded in recent years have come from here. Third, to film RAS, you need a camera crew, and ours just happened to be based in Jersey, 36 miles away as the crow flies. No, that's not a crow. That's an Orini Trilander named Joey. The inter-island bus and mainland connection. And between you and me, not unused to the odd anorak and tackle box smelling like a fish. So, let's have a look at the fishing shall we? Oh, oh. Alden. Nine miles from the Sherbourne Peninsula. At the moment, literally besieged by Sandy. Taking full advantage of this silvery harvest from their high-rise home on garden rocks, the island's slightly less conventional angling residents. The inshore waters surrounding Alderney are a meeting place of tides, birds and fish. The islands claimed by some to be the only true Channel Island, set as it is in the western approaches to the English Channel. This location puts it within a couple of hours steaming of scores of First and Second World War wrecks, tankers, passenger ships, cargo ships, even U-boats and aircraft, all man-made reefs 
each supporting its own population of ling, cod, conger, huge pollock, coal fish. Yeah, but that's another story. Our story now concerns wrasse and how to set about capturing the big nine on a British record. It's part of the optimistic makeup of the angler to believe that there's a fish out there twice the size of the existing record. Now this is international angler F.A. Mitchell Hedges, seen here with a few fish he caught in the tropics. Now he took the wrasse record as far back as 1912 with a fish of 12 pounds 12 ounces. This was set up and displayed, but unfortunately was destroyed during the London Blitz. Now that RAS record was scrubbed in 1969 along with a few others. And when a new starting weight was set, it climbed steadily from six pounds to the current record, eight pounds, six ounces, six drams. This was a Guernsey fish taken by the late Ron LePage. There it is. Ron's fish took ledgered green crab from a rocky Guernsey beach in September 76. What a fish, nice one. It's not just the location, in this case Alderney, that makes cracking the brass record possible. It's being able to look at a piece of coastline and with a combination of experience, knowledge and some low water detective work, decide where a big ballon might set up to patrol his path and earn a living. The higher the water temperature, the better. Check out the area you're going to fish at low water. Make sure it offers the wrasse the kind of food and environment he needs. We put together a team as likely as any to heave a good wrasse out of the kind of submarine tangle they live in. Debbie Loving, for example. Debbie has a couple of seven pound plus balance to her credit, and she's been mentioned in the National Angling Press on more than one occasion. She also has this soft spot for balance. See what I mean. Rob Laballast here. That's him with the top ten overcoat. You'll never find a more thoughtful angler. Rob applies a great deal of logic to this fishing. The result? A 54-pound conger from the shore, three 7-pound-plus wrasse to his credit, two of which were 7 pounds 12 ounces, and his best wrasse, 8 by 10, missed the British record by 10 rounds. Roddy Hayes, now, there's a mine of angling information here. His experience is international. He's an Alderney man whose best wrasse is six pounds twelve, and his best blue shark has been from somewhere off the peg point four hundred pounds. He's taken a twelve pound pollock on mullet gear from the end of the local breakwater, and his best tope is a fifty-five pounder taken on twelve pound up tide tackle. I could go on, but only pay me. Andy Appleby has taken more than his fair share of specimens over the years. Plenty of six pound plus wrasse, plus some superb mullet, including the Jersey boat record at four pounds four ounces. He's had conger from the shore to 40 pounds, and an undulate ray of 15. His best ever battle, he said, was with an eight pound bass on a four pound mullet there in a busy marina. Yeah, see, they're not a bad bunch, all things considered. Can't act for toffee, of course, but all the qualifications needed to be here today. The Ballon Rass is a tough proposition. He survives admirably in an environment considered by us to be almost impossible to fish with bottom gear. They share the inshore rocky marks with this power diving opportunist, the Pollock. Rass feed on a variety of crustacea such as hermit crab, barnacles, green crab and limpet. And if you've ever tried prizing old superglue off the rocks, you'll know what a hard case he is. Like that. This kind of dental arrangement is all the Rass needs to do the job. Blunt, egg-like choppers, okay. thick, tough lips. That set of teeth can handle anything from a limpet to a packet of pork scratchings. 
divers who watch wrasse feeding say they have a wonderful technique. Once the limpet is off the rock, they gradually crush the shell, blow out the hard, sharp Jim. splinters, allowing them to fall, and suck back the tasty bits. And this is how they crush the shells. Not only does the limpet have to contend with the front teeth, but deep down in the throat, there's a set of pharyngeal teeth, sort of throat crushers, which are quite capable of reducing mussel, limpet, and crab shell to dust. It's worth remembering that, by the way, when you pick up a big wrasse. Don't do it by sticking your fingers down through the gill covers. Apart from damaging the fish, it's a sure way to get a badly crushed digit. But right at this moment, bait takes priority. And this is where Operation Green Crab begins. Wrasse will take soft bait, of course, lug, ragworm, razorfish, prawn, fish shrimp. They've even been known to take a spinner at times. But generally speaking, using soft baits only leads to smaller fish at two to four pounds. Oddly enough, despite wrasse stomach contents featuring a high proportion of limpet and a hook bait, they're a dead loss. Wrasse loves squat lobster, and if you've got a mate who puts down whelk pots, try hermit crab. But for a good, all-round, easy-to-collect bait, green crab every time. If you were to look under these rocks in winter, you'd find no green crabs. And even if you did, there'd be very few ballon wrasse around to appreciate them. Both fish and bait are warm weather landed. Bucket, bucket, bucket. And the wrasse in particular is very susceptible to severe temperature change. In exceptionally cold winters like 62, 63, the species died in thousands, despite an annual move offshore to keep water. And you heard the expression, face like a bucket of crap? Who does that remind you of? Does it? He's the perfect beginner's fish, too, that's summer holiday sport and generous to a fault, which sadly makes him easy to take advantage of. And because of this, this team is trying a serious experiment during these days with a view to conserving the species. They plan to use something seldom seen as part of the sea angler's equipment, and that's a key. The plan is to retain the fish to the end of the session and then turn them to the sea. Success could mean a whole new ball game for sea fish conservation, the Ballon Rass in particular. He's not exactly a gourmet's delight, thank the Lord, but he's big, he's beautiful, and he needs looking after. He's a bit like me, really. The team first decided to fish a bay that had previously produced some jumbo ballons. Both Robert and Debbie had taken their biggest wrasse ever from me. Rob's best was the one that missed the British record by ten drowns. He got tremendous sympathy from the rest of his mates. They said, use heavier crabs. As with conger fishing from the shore, you simply can't afford to compromise with the mass, especially of the proportions we're looking for. If you insist on fishing light, you get smashed, resulting in a good fish trailing 20 or 30 feet of line behind it in a veritable jungle. Its chances of survival under such circumstances would be doubtful. The whole team knows about fishing light and do whenever the chance arises, but fishing for Ballon Rass offers no such opportunities. It's best fish too. Big Rass are not exactly subtle. When they hit a green crab the size of a 50 pence piece, the rod goes down and stays down, unless you're quick and stop the fish dead in its tracks. So, 30 pound line is not unreasonable when you consider the fish and where you're dropping the bait. Ballons are one of the few British fish that actually make a nest. They build in crevices, and when they take a dive, that's where they head to, and they literally force themselves into a tight corner. When this happens, you can forget the fish. Most times, he sheds the hook, and you're left to break free. You can keep the cost of leads down, at least, by using any old junk at all. Just attach it with some lighter line or an elastic band, and then you can break free without suffering line-cut fingers, broken rod tips. Hooks should be short, sharp and tough, just like the wife. O'Shaughnessy's are ideal for the job. These are two O's. If you use fine wire hooks, you could well straighten out on the heavier mass. You need something that will pull through a tough bait and a tough fish, so pick yourself a sturdy hook. Rods should be stiffish. They've got the power dive of the ras to contend with, the possibility of having to haul in half a ton of weed, and the pressure needed to haul free even with no weed 
can take its toll on a weak through action pole. When it comes to reels, the faster the retrieve, the better. The kind of ground the team will be fishing over the next few days can only be imagined from the surface. But when one takes the fisheye view, the reason for getting bait and weight to the surface as quickly as possible becomes obvious. At times, the bait will be dropped right over reefs, and the only way to get the gear back safely is with a very rapid retrieve. Now, this type of reel fits the bill admirably. It has good capacity for heavy line, it's tough, durable, and with a carbon body like this, it's light and it won't rust. A multiplier works well too, as long as you're totally familiar with it. If it's not like an old friend, stick to the fixed spot. Baiting with green crab is simple. Through the rear of the carapace is most effective. A single snood well above the weight completes the terminal rig, and as you can see here, it works a treat. The lead streaks down into the kelp bed, but the bait, on a longish high snood, floats down much more sedately. Once the lead has settled, the angler tightens up, presenting an irresistible meal to any self-respecting wrasse. Fishing for wrasse here, of course, you only need an ordinary landing net. This one has an extendable handle. But the ledges appear at the seawall, jetted high above the water surface. A drop net is essential. In fact, it makes the difference between success and failure. There you are, safe and sound. The first mark produced fish oil, but nothing like the size of the rock. Come on, where's the net then? The average weight of these fish was two to three pounds, so it became more and more obvious that we needed deeper water. That meant a move. But when the move came, it's to a place known locally as the Frying Pan. And that big chunk of granite out there was nicknamed Jerseyman's Rock a few years ago. Why Jerseyman's? Well, in November 1983, Jersey fished a shore competition against the Alderman and decided on an all-night session. Weighed down with gear, including two boxes of frozen squid, fresh cork mullet, and gunk. Two hours later, they'd taken 290 pounds of pond to the and had run out of bait in the process. The marks produced some good rats, too. Let's hope it does today. But the move was the move. Within minutes, Roddy's crab was bounced back. Right. Uh, be careful for the swell. Yeah, okay. Well, it's not too big, but it's a start. What weight? And then Rob hit a hefty fish and indicated it was a good one. Yeah. What weight? 
flying toad! Fortunately, Andy had had the presence of mind to take the drop net out onto the Jerseymans. No, not on top of the fish, Andy. That's a good fish. Can you see it? I like to see it. And he was right. A closer look at Robert's fish showed signs of damage. A scar just behind the dorsal that healed well, but its cause is anyone's guess. Conga, tope, seal, even a shark. There was a poor beaver sighted here next day, estimated at between five and six hundred pounds. Cruised up and down for at least half an hour for lads fish to compete with the rats. No, not an exaggeration. <laughs> All the lads saw it, and Rob and Andy had sold enough for me to Jersey's Portuguese residents to know big one when they saw it. Now that dot in the distance is not an Acapulco high diver. It's Steve Mullins, one of the Jersey lads, I think, for the festival. In fact, I feel like it's going to be a place for a fair time. It's only got to keep your eye on the swells. Well, suddenly Steve was into a good fit. And in all kinds of difficulty. When it was finally in the net, safe and sound, presenting the fish to camera wasn't easy. It was transported from the drop net to the landing net for easier handling, and then the lads edged down a steep cliff from their fishing pole. Steve's best ever lads, six pounds, eight ounces, six pounds. An impossible contender. Join the rest of the match. Oh. The keep net experiment was working beautifully. The catch of rats was building up nicely, giving the net a chance to do its work. Now, that's a sight even freshwater anglers never see. And as for sea fish, well, it's absolutely unique. The fish are contained in well oxygenated water and with plenty of room to move around. The flexible rings hold the keep net open and effectively protect the fish from damage in the swell. Really Some fish weren't put in the keep net. They were released immediately. Others were transported to the weigh-in station and then after their vital statistics were recorded, they were carefully released. And the team never lost a fish. Well, the action had been hectic, but it wasn't over. Being in the right place at the right time is what it's all about when you take a camera fish. And just as the team decided it was time to leave Jerseyman's and beat the tide, Eddie Reed tucked away in a quiet corner and the last minute the best of the bunch and the star of the shoot at just 11 ounces under the British record. Seven pounds, 11 ounces, four drowns. Good seven there. A big, bold ballon. Pints to do so on you, Eddie. Yeah. <laughs> and Eddie's not bad either. Well, we got it right. Time of year, tactics, location, all combined to produce the goodies. Some of the balance were big, almost as big as we'd hoped for, but they were all beautiful, colourful, photogenic. The prettiest by far of all the British species. The festival tally was quite remarkable. The five best wrasse took prizes, and on the daily scoreboard, only the fifth heaviest fish weight was shown. So, everybody knew the target weight and could return smaller fish at once. Alderney angler Pete Dixon began the event with his six pound 514 beauty. It proved to be the smallest of the bunch, which does spotlight the quality, you've got to admit. After fishing the north face of the Iger, Steve Mullins took fourth spot, 686. Third spot went to team man Rob Labalestier with 694. This percentage-beating cuckoo wrasse from Alderney AC man Bernie Crawford sneaked second place, just two ounces off the British record and a prize of £2,000. Bad luck, mate. Oh, yes, now this one's worth a mention. A cuckoo wrasse 
taken a couple of days before the competition by Alderney butcher Nigel Lovin. Yes, Debbie's old man. Ugly swine, isn't he? The fish was six drams under the British record. He got loads of sympathy from the lads too. Use heavier lugworm. That's what he caught it on. Andy Appleby's best fish came the day before the camera team arrived. And at six pounds, one ounce, didn't get a look in. Then, of course, there was that big belter of Eddie Reeves. Eddie picked up a cheque for £100 for his wrasse, but the cash gave him nowhere near the same pleasure as being able to return the fish to the water alive. He weighed it, measured it, had his photograph taken with it, and then returned it to the sea. It took a little encouragement, but when that big wrasse took off, back to the tangled web of kelp and pipe weed he called home, it meant a great deal to all of us. We had the fish's exact measurements and weight, and yet he was still there to fight another day. And given time, he could be the big nine we're looking for. Eddie's fish made up a unique assembly. Five Alderney Ballon Rass have taken Fish of the Week national awards in less than a year. With that kind of quality, the record is pretty shaky. And who knows, could even make double figures. Look out, Mr. Mitchell Hedges, we're after you.
Our story, based on a few days shore fishing in Alderney, is about mullet. And typical of many fishing trips, it also includes other species, the ones that turn up unexpectedly and make a story all the more fascinating. There's not enough time to cover every aspect of mullet and mulleting here, so we'll concentrate on float fishing and give star billing to the biggest and most numerous of all the British mullets, Shellon Librosis, the thick-lipped grey mullet. His fighting qualities are renowned. He'll bore to the seabed, head for the horizon, he'll charge for the kelp, and if you let him, he'll duck under boats, ropes and pier legs with enormous energy. Such strength and determination is quite remarkable because, outwardly, he's a quiet, unassuming, non-aggressive personality. Compared to the more commercial species, our knowledge of the mullet's natural history is very slim. A series of events in the 70s, however, gave the fish a much higher profile among anglers and angling writers. The splitting of the British records into shore and boat in 1976 brought a surge of interest, especially in the mullets, because three separate species emerged. Golden grey, thick-lipped and thin-lipped. Another factor instrumental in this change of attitude was the formation of the National Mullet Club in 1975. Its members played a major role in separating the species. For 23 years, the single mullet record stood at 10 pounds, one ounce. That fish is now the thick-lipped mullet boat record. This change resulted in the setting up of a new shore qualifying weight, a rather pessimistic five pounds, eight ounces. Well, the record climbed steadily over the next couple of years, changing hands at regular intervals. And when it finally crashed through the double-figure barrier, it was with spectacular results, because this man, Ray Gifford, of Aberthaw Sea Angling Club, scored a hat-trick by taking three double-figure fish in 18 months, culminating in this giant of 14 pounds, 2 ounces, 12 drams. The press had a field day. Ray had broken the British record three times, and the total weight of fish was in excess of 35 pounds. Brian Hoyle of Mimicry in Somerset took a plaster cast of the fish. He made a hundred, in fact. A limited addition to mark an astonishing feat of angling. The fish was taken from the Lees, a saltwater lagoon on the Glamorganshire coast. The details of the capture are these. The weight, 14 pounds, 2 ounces, 12 drams. Date of capture, 19th of October, 1979. The bait was float fish bread, and the initial run stripped 150 yards of line off the reel. It took 50 minutes to beat the fish on a size 10 hook. The family Mooglidae is spread worldwide and is known as far south as Port Stanley and as far north as Reykjavik. Of the British mullets, the thick-lipped is the one most likely to take the angler's bait. He's less inclined to visit the brackish waters of upper estuaries like his thin-lipped brother, and because of his particular love of harbours, coves and bays where food abounds in summer, the chances are it'll be him under the holiday pier, coasting over the harbour mud, testing old fish bones, exploring the local sewage outfall. Now, at first glance, it'd be easy to relate this soft-mouthed, gentle fish to the wild carp of Britain's lakes and rivers. Like these carp, mullet are vegetarians who can easily be persuaded otherwise. They both love basking in the surface sunshine of calm summer waters, and both are powerfully dogged fighters to boot. But cousin to the carp? Not a bit of it. The mullets are related to this razor-toothed hunter-killer, the barracuda. Not a lot of people know that. The grey mullet enjoy the freedom of all the pelagic species using the ocean's upper surface layers and shallow coastal waters in which to earn a living. And it's their feeding habits which interest the angler. It's the mullet's Catholic taste that's the key to successful sport. Our mullet is a cordon bleu gourmet, and he could be tempted from the gentle sucking of pipe weed and a diet of diatomes to shin of beef or soft white bread with very little persuasion. Nature's provided him with a tough bird-like gizzard, an excellent mashing machine that copes admirably with a variety of organic food materials sifted from the harbour mud or rasped from the rock and the weed with tiny abrasive teeth set in a tough upper lip. In his case, the soft mouth rumour is a total fallacy. His breeding habits are a little vague, but it is thought that only a proportion of mature fish breed each year. When water temperatures drop steeply in winter, the fish move from their summer haunts into deeper water. 
They overwinter there and reappear in huge shoals, presumably perfectly timed for spring breeding. This shoal, filmed in the cold waters of the English Channel, is a magnificent sight. It also gives an impression of endless abundance, but don't let it fool you. This habit of collecting in huge shows during the winter months makes them frighteningly vulnerable to modern commercial fishing techniques. Pair trawling this show, which in area extends surface to seabed some six acres, would destroy a high percentage of the British thick lip mullet stock. Hardly bears thinking about. The huge shoals of black bream which visited British waters in the 50s and 60s changed from a mighty invasion to what has now become an annual trickle, thanks to the development of the echo sounder. And the same thing has happened with bass, through the development and overuse of monofilament nets. The female thick lips mature at around 14 to 16 inches, 41 centimetres, and it takes 11 or 12 years to reach this size. This shoal is made up with almost all mature fish, and as plentiful as they seem here, spread them evenly from Land's End to the Wash, and they suddenly start to become a bit thin on the ground. They become, like the bass, worth looking after. Anglers more used to the hard-biting, rod-rattling species like this wrasse will find that the mullet is no pushover. In fact, at times, he can be the most frustrating fish in the sea but coarse anglers would love him. They might find his high visibility a bit unnerving at first, but they'd soon overcome that. And I think that on trout tackle, a four-pound mullet might stretch more than loyalties. I remember a few years ago, we were fishing for sea trout in Ireland, and somebody had a four-and-a-quarter-pound mullet on a Dunkeld, and that was quite something, I can tell you. He'll feed in 30 feet of murky water, be totally invisible at three feet in an estuary, but on the coast, in settled weather, there's nothing more likely to put the adrenaline on the boil than half a dozen fat mullet ghosting into the swim from nowhere. In such conditions, the old adage, if you can't see them, they're not there, works. And then, it's time to ground bait. When bites are not forthcoming, ground bait is invariably the key to success. Often it's just a loose, wet bread mixture with perhaps a touch of pilchard oil for flavour. But in Alderney, they prefer something with a little more body. Here, it's offal, fish, rusk, water, pilchard oil, and a little liver blood. You let it stand a couple of days, and it provides a good cloudy texture which streams down tide and makes a wide, attractive road for the mullet to follow. So, what about tackle? Let's take a look at the rods first, and then we'll put a complete set of gear together. Sea anglers who include mullet in their list of sport fish cotton on to light tackle very quickly. Now you'd be hard pressed to find the perfect mullet rod because circumstances govern each situation. The likely size of fish, the weather, the kind of bottom. But in a nutshell, you need to balance the rod and the reel with three pound to eight pound line. Keep the rod over 10 feet and not too stiff, say one and a quarter to one and a half pound test curve. You need a rod with enough action to absorb the mullet's fighting capabilities without it being so underpowered that you lose control of the fish. As Roddy Hayes and I found out, there's a great spin-off when you're mullet fishing, especially down south. It comes in the shape of a hard-fighting, green-boned, long-nosed mini marlin, the garfish. The ground bait, location, time of year and tackle suit him fine. Again, he's a fish that freshwater anglers would love. He'll give your float a sliding bream bite one second, then zonk it like a dace the next. He'll tip your float sideways, sink it a millimetre at a time, and then leap over it with the bait in his mouth before you realise he's hooked. Roddy, that's snipe. Thank you. <laughs> yes, snipe. It's the there Jersey name for garfish. Go. go on, Sam. Pop out of that, Sam. Way! Fair walker. We used thin strips of fish as bait. Certainly helped to pass the time, but the ground bait kept going in for the mullet.
Unlike gear, the garfish is a thrill a minute, and if there's ground bait in the water, he's likely to turn up at some point. He's a lovely saltwater bonus, and he's great to eat. Meanwhile, back to the mullet. Now, this is interesting. This is how it used to be done. 20 feet of bamboo knuckles with a simple cleat or center pin reel loaded with cutty hunk line. A two ounce lead bullet, four feet of gut hook length, and away you go. It's a bit like the old roach pole, isn't it? It's still used in some areas for the do not disturb method. You hook your fish and remove him from the water by the shortest route in the least possible time. An interesting old reel too. There's a special trigger for taking off the ratchet. Quite an innovation in its time. The rig works too, as Pete Double proved. There you are, look at that. It's a funny looking mullet, Pete. <laughs> the majority of anglers use a fixed spool reel for thick lip mullet, although there are exceptions. Some specialists use the coarse angler's centre pin for long trotting, fast flowing waters like estuaries, but in general, it's a fixed spool sport. The advantages are obvious. It's quick to change a spool, there's easy access to tension control, and for casting ultralight tackle, it's perfect. Two or three spools is a good idea too, loaded with, say, three pound, five pound, and eight pound line. This way you can meet circumstances as they arise. I mean, there's no point in hooking a five pound mullet on three pound line if he can nip into a five knot tie with just a little flick of his tail. Another time, you'll get regular bites on three pound line, but not on five pound. So, generally speaking, line breaking strains depend on circumstances, but rarely is it necessary to go over eight pound. Now, I've seen the odd mullet sink floats as big as navigation buoys, but in general, the heavier end of the coarse anglers range and the lighter sea floats are fine. These long antennae floats are great close to the surface in calm conditions, and high in sloppy water. And if the fish are way off or you're fishing high above the water with lots of wind about, then these light polystyrene sea floats work well. Tackling up couldn't be simpler. Use the reel line right through. This way you avoid unnecessary knots. Run the float up the line. The swan shot will act as a stop and govern the hook length, which is about three feet. A sliding stop knot above the float is essential as it sets the depth at which the bait fishes. And then, of course, you need a hook. I've known anglers go down to a size 18, but once you've lost a couple of good fish, the inclination is to choose something between freshwater 10s and 4s. Shank length and gape are a matter of preference. More important is a sharp point and a modest barb to help fast penetration on the strike. Now, of course, bait is a very important factor, and the choice is endless. Fresh pork or beef work well, so you better make friends with your local butcher. And the coarse angler's maggots match those found in loose weed on sun-warmed beaches. A section of white ragworm really work well as hook bait, too. These are known in the Channel Islands as white cat. Looks more like spaghetti, doesn't it? Lovely. An invaluable part of mulleting equipment is a pair of polarized sunglasses. Some anglers will say you can't fish without them and get the best results, and I'm inclined to agree. They certainly take out the glare and lessen the strain during long sessions. Right, we've covered the kind of tackle best suited to mulleting with a float, and the baits most likely to hold their interest. But where do we start looking for the fish? Where exactly are the mullet's summer and autumn haunts? He could be just offshore, prowling beneath the moored vessels in the bay, or investigating weed-covered store boxes and the chains that hold them down. Areas like these provide an abundance of food for shoaling summer mullet, and it's a place to consider when looking for sport from a dinghy. Often you'll see them, dorsal fins out of the water, basking in glass-smooth conditions. He could be tight up against the harbour wall, feeding among offal and fish carcasses, common to harbours the world over.
His partiality for bread, meat, and other typical human foods leads him to another source, generously provided by us on summer beaches. The rising tide could wash out a variety of soft food stuff for him to sample at leisure here. Then, of course, there are scores of new marinas, providing a supermarket of tidbits. Our seaboard activities are an immense bonus to the mullet. Cleaning nets, discarding old long-line baits, fish processing plants, they all encourage his presence. Given this type of environment, you can bet he'll be around right through the summer and autumn, offering sport and frustration in varying quantities. Occasionally, when you're nosing around typical mullet locations in spring, you could hook this warty old character, the lump sucker. These are his eggs, pushed into an odd cone shape by continuous nudging with his blunt nose. This old fella sustained a bit of damage. They often get stranded by the tide and he could have taken a bit of a battering from the swell in some rock pool area. They aren't exactly powerful swimmers. His wife deserted him once the eggs were laid and he's been left holding the fort. And he'll guard them from marauding winkles, blennies, wrasse, flounders and sea urchins until they hatch. When they do, he'll blow the larvae into the tide and then they're on their own. He lives in depths of up to a thousand feet and is, according to Professor Alwyn Wheeler, part of the diet of sperm whales. It's tough at the bottom. And his eggs, just to make matters worse, are an excellent alternative to caviar. We chose Alderney to fish for mullet. It has all the ingredients for a great mullet session, including an October sea temperature of 14 degrees Celsius. There are a hundred other places spread around Britain, but this one is close to base, Jersey. And it's only three and a half by one and a half miles wide. So, all the likely mullet hotspots are close together and easy to cover. The end of the big breakwater drew a blank. Plenty of garfish, as we saw earlier, but the ground bait was attracting everything but mullet. Black-headed gulls picked up the floating bits. Small coal fish stole the ground and hook bait before it reached the right depth. And nothing spooks a mullet show quicker than that fella. Halfway along the breakwater, however, things were better. Rob Labalestier and Andy Appleby, both out to catch mullet for the camera, had found some fish. The ground bait keeps the fish interested. The eyes are glued to the floats. And Andy strikes. What a modest lad. Three and a half pounds, actually. And it was taken from a shoal which disappeared as quickly as it arrived. Yep. Andy took a couple of fish, and it gave the lads their first ever opportunity to see something they'd heard about, but never actually witnessed before. Fish tagging. President Dave Rigdon and a party yeah, of National sure. Mullet Club members have tagged 32 fish during their stay in Alderney. Length and weight are recorded. And the tags, bright yellow plastic,
provide information in French and English about where to return them and the fact that there's a reward. Braided terrelene holds the tag in place and this is passed through the fish between the first and second dorsal with a curved surgical needle. The scales are kept to read the fish's age. Yes, it does look awful, but judging by the number of successful returns from extensive bass tagging operations, this could be a vital part of the study of the mullet's natural history. Well, that's it. Complete. So, keep your eyes open, lads. The tag is worth a fiver, and the information you give in return will be invaluable in future studies on mullet. Into the water, and away like a rocket. The hunt for mullet continued with word that there were fish off the commercial jetty. There were indeed.